This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to Oceanside Library and Cornell Cooperative Extension's Garden to Table program. Today we'll be discussing winter squash. I now like to introduce our presenters, Beth and Nicole, the Cornell Cooperative Extension educators. Thank you so much, guys. Take it away. Okay, so today, as Ocaria said, we're going to be talking about winter squash. I'm Beth Ricciardi. I'm going to do the gardening section. How do we grow it? And when I'm finished, Nicole Barukov is going to tell you what to do with it once you've grown it. She is our nutritionist. So when I am growing a plant, I like to know where it came from. Squash came from Central America. And from there, people cultivated it and it spread both into South America to a certain extent, but especially into North America. And it spread all over into North America, mostly as part of the Three Sisters Garden, which is a traditional Native American garden combining corn, beans, and squash grown in the same space. The squash add both a structural and a nutritional component to this garden of three foods. But that, of course, is another topic for another lecture. So squash, what are they related to? They're in a family called the cucurbits. And all of these plants are related, the winter squash and pumpkins, summer squash, gourds, cucumbers, and melons. And the reason this matters is that when plants are related, they share characteristics. So you can sort of see how they grow similarly. And they also share similar problems, which as a gardener becomes very important. All of these plants, the cucurbits, they share the same bitter toxic compound called cucurbitacin, I believe. Nicole can tell you more about that. Um, but people have been breeding them to be more palatable, less bitter, and um, essentially more nutritious. These are annual plants. They are vigorous annual plants. That means they will grow, bloom, produce fruits, and set seed, and then they will die naturally. Um, they are vines. They have spectacular tendrils, which if you've ever grown them are very fun to watch. They have large leaves and usually prickly and hairy stems. They're very bold and dramatic looking plants. Um, they are a plant that produces male and female flowers on the same plant. They require animal pollination. Pollen has to move from a male flower to a female flower for there to be any fruit. And this is something that you need to know as a gardener because now and then the weather doesn't cooperate or the pollinators don't cooperate and you might actually have to do a little of the pollination yourself. It's not difficult and I'll address that later, uh, but it's just an interesting fact about the squash. The fruit which we eat, we do not call it a fruit and we don't cook with it as fruit. Botanically, it is a fruit because it has seeds inside and it's actually a specialized berry called a pepo. Um, it doesn't resemble a berry in any other way than the way it's put together botanically, so we're never really gonna call it that. So what do we mean by winter and summer squash? Well, frequently they're related. Some of them are even the same species group. Um, summer squash are simply squash fruits that are harvested before the fruit is finished. So it is still immature. The seeds are not finished. So if you eat a zucchini, you know those seeds are very soft. Um, you sometimes don't even have to cook them. I've had raw zucchini in a salad and it's just fine. You can eat the whole thing, including the rind, and it doesn't really have the longest shelf life. Uh, some of us who've left cucumbers and summer squash in the refrigerator for a little too long found out when we took out a bag of liquid. Winter squash, on the other hand, are harvested when the fruit is really genuinely finished. Um, the seeds inside are ready to be planted again and make new plants. It has a nice, hard, waxy, waterproof shell. So it has a very long storage life. You usually do not eat the rind. There are a very few winter squash, like the delicata, where you can eat it. Um, but this is a plant that requires a lot of preparation. You've got to get it out of that rind and you're going to have to do substantial cooking. A pumpkin is just a name for a particular type of winter squash. That's what we call the roundish orange ones with ribs that look like pumpkins to us. Um, so pumpkins are 
winter squash. Now there are several different species of winter squash and there are two reasons why this matters. Uh, the first is that within a species they will cross pollinate. So for instance, this particular spe species, Q. curbata moschata, has the butternut squash and the Long Island cheese pumpkins, they will cross pollinate if they are in the garden together, which means if you're saving the seeds, you might get something very peculiar next year. It's not really going to make any difference in the fruits themselves. You're still going to get a butternut squash, squash plant and the Long Island cheese pumpkin on the Long Island cheese plant. Um, but also the same species share characteristics such as disease susceptibility or disease resistance. And the same goes for pests. Butternut squash is now one of my favorites and I will plant anything else in that species because they are very, very resistant to one of the nastiest squash pests, the squash vine borer. They very seldom bother my butternut squash, whereas they go very happily for some of the other things. Um, so again, this is another nice group, all related, acorn, delicata, dumpling, spaghetti, and pumpkins. They are all the same species. Again, they will cross-pollinate, have certain characteristics in common. And yet another one. And here you've got the buttercup, the hubbard, the kabocha, turk's cap, a couple of other, or turk's turban, I believe it's called, and a couple of sort of the show pumpkins. And then there are a few miscellaneous species. You've got the kushas in there, which I've actually never eaten. It's possible that Nicole has. Um, and a few fancy others. But this is a group of related species of plants. And they grow similarly, but as I said, they do share certain characteristics that you need to keep an eye on as a gardener. So when you are planning to put these things in, you need to know where to put them and you need to know what you are going to have to do. Um, like many of our cultivated vegetables, these are spoiled plants. In fact, winter squash are some of the greediest plants I have ever grown. They really want that full sun, full, full sun. They want well-drained soil like every other vegetable that anybody tells you about. Um, they cannot stand sitting in a puddle. And they want that usual pH just slightly on the acid side of neutral. They love organic matter. Some of the healthiest squash that I've ever grown grew spontaneously out of my compost. I had some beautiful kabocha squash in there last year that I didn't know were going to show up. And I have a Turk's turban coming out of it this year because they love all that tremendous organic matter and the nutrition. And these guys are big, so you're gonna have to have a place that's large enough to put them. Now, I know some summer squash, like zucchini, are sort of bushy, and they're still pretty big, but they stay essentially where you put them. There are a few winter squash that are bushy. Most of them are long, rangy, badly behaved vines, and they're a lot of fun to grow, but they are going to try to roam around. Um, if you're growing squash, you're gonna have to take care of it. It's gonna want a lot of water, you're gonna to wanna to mulch or weed around it. I discovered this year that it's not a good idea to have other plants growing under your squash because that's where the squash bugs hide and then they come out and eat your squash. Uh, it is going to want a lot of fertility. So I usually just add a whole bunch of compost to the area where I'm putting winter squash, but if you don't do that, you might also wanna fertilize. And you're gonna to have to keep on top of the situation because they are susceptible to a lot of different garden pests and these things can be remediated if you stay on top of the situation. But if you're not watching what's going on, the problems can get away from you. And as I said, if you have some weird weather or there's just not a lot of pollinators around, you might have to do a little hand pollinating yourself. Um, and also as with most vegetable crops, you really don't wanna plant the same family of plants in the same spot. So if you're planting squash in one place this year, you're not going to want to put melons there the next year. Remember, they're related and they will share the problems. Um, so what do you pick? Which kind? You just said there's four different species and maybe even more. Well, what do you like to eat? I am never going to plant acorn squash because I don't like it. But I love delicata and I love butternut. 
Now within those categories, once I know what I want to eat, I'm also going to think about what is easiest for me to take care of. Even butternut squash, as much as I love it, gets powdery mildew. So I'm going to look for a type of butternut squash that's maybe disease resistant, or maybe one that is a bush type that's shaped a little more like a zucchini because I have limited space in my vegetable garden. And I also want to make sure that I'm not picking a gigantic pumpkin that's going to take more time to grow than I have in my season. Um, where do you get the squash? Well, I like to plant mine from seed. It's the cheapest thing to do, it's the easiest thing to do, and it's the most fun thing to do. Seed catalogs have hundreds of different varieties to choose from. Even garden centers have a perfectly nice selection. Um, if you want to buy plants, you can get them from farmers markets, and I definitely recommend local growers. Um, if you get something at a big box store that's been shipped in from another state, well, it might not be suitable for our area, and it might also be shipping in some problems with it. So sometimes when you get things shipped from somewhere else and there's a disease problem there, guess what you just put into your garden. So try to stay local. And for the same reason, don't use volunteers. That means the seedlings that came up from last year's pumpkins. For one thing, you don't want to be planting in the same place. And for another, if there was another squash around that was the same species, you don't know if it's going to be the pumpkin that you planted last year or something that's a little bit different. And that could be fun, but I still don't recommend it purely for the disease and pest issues that carry over from one year to another. If you insist on starting your seeds indoors before it's time to plant outside, which I do sometimes do because I like planting seeds indoors. It gets me through the winter. Um, but you can't keep them indoors for long. These are plants that do not want to be moved. So you're going to do it uh, at most three to four weeks before you plant them outside. And I'm going to discuss timing in just a few minutes. <clears throat> they are, remember where they came from, Central America. They want light and they want warmth. So you've got to give them bright light and you've got to keep them warm enough. I generally use biodegradable pots because that reduces the transplant shock. I don't have to take it back out of a pot when I put it in the ground outside. And that helps the plant a little bit. Uh, if you grow inside, window sills really don't always cut it. For one thing, if you're starting them early, the window is gonna be cold. And remember, they don't want that. Uh, you gotta give them enough warmth. They have to be in a warmer part of your house than right next to the window. Um, plant lights can't do cost money, but it's worth investing in a small one. You can probably get one like the little desk lampy thing there for maybe 40 bucks, maybe 35. I haven't priced it out, but they're not a terrible investment. And if you wanna start a few seedlings, they're a great thing to have. I have light shelves like those ones in the middle. Those are quite expensive, but I've grown thousands of different garden vegetable seedlings on my shelves. So for me, the investment has paid off. And the nice thing about these lights, the plant lights, you can put them anywhere in your house. You don't have to take up all your windowsills with little seedlings. So starting them outside. Timing is really, really important. The soil temperature has got to be over 65 degrees. In fact, winter squash germinates best at a soil temperature of about 80 or 90 degrees. Most of us, however, don't wanna wait until you know the end of July to plant them, but you just need to keep in mind, they are not gonna be happy and they're not gonna do well unless it's warm outside. So some people wanna stick that stuff in the ground on Memorial Day, but the last couple of years, Memorial Day has not been reliably warm. So remember, plant a little later rather than sooner. When you look at your seed packet, it's gonna tell you how long it takes for your squash to mature. And usually it's between 90 and 120 days. So that's three to four months. Our first frost date, which you want your plant to be finished before that, they do not like freezing cold. Our first frost date is November 4th. So you wanna count backwards from that. So you need to plant, if you have a very long season, one that takes 120 days, you're gonna to have to go four months before November 4th is when you put in your seeds. If you have one that only takes 90 days, you can even wait a little longer. So don't be in too much of a hurry to put these outside. Now remember when you're planting, don't plant where you've had plants in the same family before. If you had cucumbers there last year, 
it's not a good place for your winter squash. Um, the traditional way to plant is to plant just a couple of seeds in a little grouping. You're not gonna keep them all. This is basically an insurance policy. A bird might eat one, a gopher might eat one, one of them might not sprout. So you're just putting in several plants and you plant them on a mound. This makes them a little bit raised. They absorb the sun a little bit. It guarantees the water is gonna drain nicely off of their roots. I flatten the top of the mound so that it holds the water and the water doesn't run off really, really fast down the sides, but you don't have to. Uh, and then after they've come up, you thin it down so you have only one or two plants in that mound. It needs to be kept weeded and it needs to be kept watered. So here's you know, a picture of you can space out the mounds by using string, you can just sort of estimate. Um, that is a pretty good spacing for zucchini, which is a bush type summer squash. That would be very close planting for say pumpkins, which would never produce much that close to one another. And it looks like they're spaced really far apart, but when you think about how big these guys get, it's really not that close. So remember your timing is anywhere from early June to the middle of July. It has to be warm outside. Uh, and make sure that before you put the seeds out there, you've done what you need to do. You put in your compost and organic matter. If you were gonna lay sprinkler lines, you've laid them down already before you put the seeds in. Um, seeds are very, very easy to plant. Shove them in with your finger until your finger disappears to the first knuckle, that's about it. Uh, if you've grown them indoors, harden them off properly before you put them in the ground. That means you get them used to the outdoors for a few hours at a time in a sheltered spot every day for a couple of days. Otherwise, they get a bit of a shock when you stick them outside with the temperature swings and the direct sun and all that kind of thing. And when you put them in, make sure you give them enough room. They look very lonely when they're coming up there, those tiny little seedlings, but they are going to take off. And just as with tomatoes, which is another wonderful, nutritious, favorite home crop, the secrets to growing squash are prevention. So you set it up so that things are likely to go well. And attention, you do need to know what is going on out in your garden. And again, they want a lot of water. They do not like competition from other plants. A lot of the pests that feed on squash will hide in the weeds. Um, at guidance, that means, as I said, these are rangy plants. They're gonna to try to escape. They're going to go somewhere. They don't grow in rows naturally. They cover everything they can find. So you're gonna to have to watch those vines try to invade your lawn and gently put them back into the garden. If you didn't put a lot of compost in, you might wanna fertilize because as I said, they're very hungry, greedy plants. And you need to keep an eye on the weather and on the pollinators and on the actual flowers. Because as I said, you might have to hand pollinate. That is not difficult, by the way. So don't be intimidated by that. But you need to know what's going on. If you're not seeing any bees, if it's really, really cold, something like that, you might have to do the pollination yourself. And of course, you're looking for the problems, the pests and diseases, so you can catch them early. This is a picture of the male and female flowers. If you turn them sideways and look at the bottom, it's really obvious. The female flower has that little preformed fruit underneath. That's going to turn into the squash. And the male flower does not have it. If you look at the interior, the male flower has sort of a single spike in the middle covered with pollen. The female flower looks like a bunch of little knuckles in the middle. Uh, and all you do is you take a Q-tip or a paintbrush or whatever, you get some pollen on it from the male flower and you put it in the female flower. It's very easy. So what do you do when you have problems and squash do have a large list of problems, diseases and pests and a few other problems. Um, the diseases you really need to keep an eye out for are the viral and bacterial diseases, something like the mosaic disease in the middle that is a virus, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you see that on the plant, you rip the plant out and you put it in the garbage, not your compost. You can also get bacterial wilt. Powdery mildew, however, is not actually a really serious problem. Um, you can try to spray it off with the hose when it appears. That actually does wash some of the spores off. 
but basically you just if you give your plant enough space and enough sun the powdery mildew may disfigure it and make it look kind of ugly but it might not kill it for a while depending on which variety you've picked some varieties are very susceptible to powdery mildew so again it matters which pumpkin you chose was it resistant to powdery mildew or was it susceptible to it um, the big problems for me in the garden with squash are those insects. The squash vine borer, which is the first picture, the one on the bottom left, it's a pretty little moth, but it lays its eggs on the stem and the larvae bore into the stem and they make this disgusting mess and obviously mess all of everything up inside the stem and the plant eventually cannot function and dies. Um, the squash bug, which is in the middle, and the striped or spotted cucumber beetles on the right are also quite problematic. They uh, produce damage very quickly, especially the squash bug. And the cucumber beetle is a terrible disease vector. So it can go and suck on your cucumber. And if the cucumber has a mosaic virus, the cucumber beetle can bring it over to your squash plant. So you do need to be on top of what's going on in your garden. And you can look up online, any cooperative extension service will give you wonderful guidelines on how to deal with any of the different problems that come up with your squash plants. I certainly can't cover them all here. And the other problem that comes up with squash, and I run into this every year, is they're big, they are big. I cannot say this enough, they're big. And you really need to plan for that. Um, I left Vermont Hawk one year when I was growing butternut squash, 10 days in August, and when I came back, the butternut squash had staged a coup and they took over. My entire vegetable garden was covered with squash and it was climbing out into the lawn. And I got some great squash, but my husband was really annoyed because he works very hard on the lawn. Um, so you just really need to plan for how big it's gonna get. If you're gonna grow up on a trellis, which is a great idea, they love climbing, you need to remember how big and heavy they're gonna get. And you might have to arrange something like a sling, which looks a little funny and it seems kind of fussy, but that means that the heavy fruit won't break the vine, which can sometimes be a problem. So when you have a problem, the solution should generally come under the large umbrella of integrated pest management IPM, which means use your head and think. Um, so you have to look not only at what you're seeing on your plant, but the conditions. What time of year is it? Is it August? Is it October? What just happened? Did you have a downpour? Has there been a drought? What's going on? And then you need to properly identify the problem. And if you Google images for, you know, squash leaf problem or, you know, squash fruit damage, and then follow that with cooperative extension service, you will get a series of images. You can match up the one that looks like your plant, and you can find out what the problem is. But you do need to know what the problem is. Powdery mildew is a different problem from a squash bug. And you will need to know what you're looking at because if you spray insecticide on powdery mildew, nothing's going to happen. So it's important to know what the problem is. And then you use appropriate solutions, as many solutions as you need in order to solve the problem, starting with the least harmful, which means your cultural practices. That means how did you plant it? Did you give it enough space? Did you mulch it? How often are you watering? That's the preventive part. Um, you can also use mechanical controls. That means you do something physical. I squished a lot of squash bug eggs this summer and it was kind of gross, but it did help. Um, biological controls means you try to bring nature in to solve your problem. So you release predators or you use um, bacterial sprays that you know attack particular bugs which i don't really like to do um, and chemical controls are your last resort but again use your head and work your way through the problem at the end of the season when your squash are ready and they are generally ready when the rind is very hard and you cannot easily make a mark on it with your thumbnail then you take your wonderful squashes and you let them sit quietly in the dry in the dark for a little while before you eat them and you clean out your garden. So be sure you take out all of that debris with the squash family plants. That's particularly important because those pests, if you got any of them on your plants, they will overwinter in the plant debris and in the soil. 
So you want to take that stuff out of the garden and put it in the garbage because you don't want those guys to come back next year. Um, protect your soil for next year's plants, whatever you put in there. That means you put in a cover crop, which will improve and hold your soil, protect it from erosion, or you can just mulch it. And you plan for next year. Remember, don't plant the same thing in the same spot every year. So where are you gonna put the squash next year if you're gonna grow it? What are you gonna put in the squash spot next year? And if you grow your squash in a container, which can be done with the smaller bushy types, make sure you clean it really, really well. You do not want those problems carrying over from one season to another. And so after you've picked it, again, Nicole can tell you exactly what to do with it. Thank you, Beth. I do have a question because yeah. I have a relatively small garden. So I have an L-shaped garden. So if I, this is the second year that I got the squash vine borers and they destroyed my crop. I skipped a year completely because I was devastated. But if I grew it on one part of the L, is this far enough away? I would say the longer part of my L is maybe like five feet by four feet and the shorter part is maybe like four feet. So that's sort of the distance. Do you think that's far enough away? Well, probably. The squash bugs are the ones that are, I think, more likely to burrow into the soil. Um, I am not actually, I would have to look up the squash vine borer life cycle and see. I mean, I have them every year that I plant squash anywhere. So, you know, I grew it at East Meadow Farm this year and I hadn't grown it there last year, as far as I know, and I got squash vine borers and I got squash bugs and I just had to keep on top of it, try to cut the borers out, try to squish the squash bugs. Um, so just keep an eye. It's, uh, and the, the diseases are, that would definitely be far enough to prevent the diseases. The insects, I don't know. Okay, they're, they're miserable. They make me uh, Okay, but thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I always learn a lot from you because I sort of, I wing it. And then I am hopefully gonna take the tips that you've, you've given me and use it for next year. <laughs> make things a little bit better um yeah so and i really and it's so interesting because you know even with the previous garden to table programs you know the pests didn't seem to be such a problem and so this was so interesting that this was such a bigger part of your presentation and it's really good to know especially now nicole said it happens to you often and it's really good to know before you start planting Thank you so much. It's a, yeah, it's a, I'm not aware of it. So the first year it ever happened, I had no idea what was happening. All of a sudden, I'm like, maybe I'm not giving it enough water because I didn't know to investigate the stem. And of course, you know, by the time you figure it out, it's too late. And it yeah. just, it's like devastating. It is. <laughs> oh, it is. Awful. I hate them. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, you Beth. So let me turn off your... Um, Thank you. I wasn't sure how to turn off okay, my dismiss Beth as person. Oh, okay. okay, you did it. Perfect. Thank you. Yay, I did it. So now Nicole, I'm going to make you presenter. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Beth. It's a perfect way to lean into what exactly we're supposed to do with these winter squash once we get them at like at, I would shouldn't say out of the ground, but out of the garden. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk about would be the health benefits of this group. So like Beth mentioned, you know, this is sort of like the winter squash group and they're not harvested in the winter, right? So, or grown in the winter, um, as we would assume by the name. So they're picked in the fall and they can be stored, I think, until spring. Okay, Beth's shaking her head, yes. Um, so you can imagine that the, you know, if you look at some of, I'll just fast forward uh, one slide so you can see. So you can't necessarily see the inside of these, but we sort of all know that a lot of these have a similar coloring inside, right? They're sort of in that orangey yellow family. And so we have a lot of these alpha carotene and beta carotene compounds. So those convert to vitamin A. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. They're also a great source of vitamin C, good source of fiber, rich in certain minerals like potassium, and they also have different antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds. And it is a very dense filling food, despite being relatively low in calories, 
Um, so it is considered a starchy vegetable, although, you know, compared to a potato or something, it, you know, it has almost half the amount of um, carbohydrate in the same serving as, say, a potato, which is interesting, especially to somebody who's, you know, sort of paying attention to their carb servings or something like that. So again, I just love looking at them because I think they're so beautiful and there are so many different varieties that sort of Beth, you know, gave us a good introduction to. And they're very versatile, you know, depending on the type. And I did have one more question for Beth and I can ask it now and you can answer me later. What's a gourd? Is a gourd more of a decorative item? Is that sort of what you see around Thanksgiving and, and you know, Halloween that sits on your table? <laughs> well, they're, they're another part of one of those species groups. I'm sorry, I've forgotten whether it was Mixta or Maxima or anyway, they're in there and most of, the, most of them have not been bred to get rid of that bitter compound. So many of them are not edible. There are um, a few exceptions, but um, I think that originally they were cultivated to be useful. Hmm, um, they were used as containers and implements. Uh, and they're still good for that. I mean, people make bird houses out of them and, you know, dippers and so forth. But generally, they're not for eating. And now we just breed them to be decorative. That's what I sort of had in my mind as um, as the answer. But I'm glad to know that you, you could give me sort of <laughs> the confirmation. So I'm probably going to butcher the name. I don't know it as well as Beth does. The curcubitae say family or we could just call it the curcubit i think that maybe that's easier for me to say um so all the different squash and you know pumpkins that um beth mentioned and ancient people used them medicinally so we also know that they have this toxic property that beth mentioned um and those bitter i'll put them in quotes like bitter principles right um had medicinal uses way back when so emetics so they would actually make somebody throw up which, which would make sense right a narcotic or even an anti-malarial. And I'm no expert in this sort of ancient traditional medicine, but it was very interesting when I was, you know, doing my little research that even though we consider it to be toxic to some level, it was used medicinally. Um, but our ancestors did find that they could eat the seeds, in particular when they washed sort of that bitter compound out and cooked it, you know, cooked it out. But they did domesticate these squashes a little bit more and selected, like Beth said, the less bitter seeds. And they were able to produce something a little more palatable, you know, and sort of closer to what we see today. And when eaten in small amounts, it's totally fine. It might be like a little bit bitter, not harmful. And we don't really, you know, eat these raw to begin with. Same thing like potatoes. We don't really eat a raw potato. Um, in larger amounts, the toxin can, you know, be a little bit more bitter, cause stomach cramps, vomiting, some GI upset. But again, we don't really have a lot of research on that because it's very rare because people typically aren't eating this raw. Um, so that absorption, the digestion, the way we metabolize and excrete it hasn't really been you know, studied because that, that sort of poisoning is very rare. So again, that bright yellow-orange represents that carotenoid that we see um, linked with all kinds of um, health benefits and disease protection. And it will sort of depend on the variety, um, the amounts of things like the vitamin A, the B12, B6, vitamin C, vitamin K, different minerals. So again, the, the different variety will sort of affect the nutrient um, profile. But again, that vitamin A, we see it in research for cancer prevention, eye health in particular, immune function, uh, function just to name, to name a few. <laughs> And similar to lycopene, the beta carotene is more available to us when we um, cook it and also when we add a little bit of oil. So that healthy fat helps to aid in absorption. So pumpkins in particular, we think of like pumpkin spice lattes, jack-o'-lanterns, pumpkin pie, but historically it's used throughout the globe, you know, in various traditional um, foods. So in the Caribbean and South America, in Asia, even think, you know, soup, stews, dumplings, um, stir fries, things like that. And pumpkins are also, you know, just as nutritionally dense, depending on, again, on that variety that you're comparing it to. Um, and you can get pumpkin year round. And um, Beth might have a better idea as well. So I don't know what variety they put in canned pumpkin. Um, and you do want to make sure you're not getting pumpkin pie filling, right? So it is something um, that we can access year round. And cooked squash freezes well. So again, we can, you know, especially if you have success in your garden or if you have a CSA and you get a ton of a certain squash, you can you can, can you part 
partly cook it and freeze it and use it throughout the winter. So when you're choosing, and I think Beth touched on this a little bit, you want ones that are heavy for their size, that sort of have a matte look. They're not shiny, they're not soft. Um, you don't wanna be able to pierce it that easily with your fingernail. And you can also do a tap test, I believe it's called. So if it sounds dull, it might be unripe or spoiled, but if it sounds hollow, it's ripe. And again, Beth, you can shake your head yes or no if that sounds, if that sounds right to you. Um, and they're you know obviously much denser they have a tougher skin than their summer squash you know cousins if you want to call it and they take much longer to cook but that shouldn't deter you i think it's this is my favorite season to cook in i love roasting everything i like soups and stews and all that so the hard shell i mean yes it means that it's harder to you know manipulate and handle and cut but it can be stored longer right like beth said they don't need refrigeration like a lot of other things like onions and potatoes, you do want to store it in a cool, dry place. Um, keep it away from sunlight, ideally. It can last one to three months, potentially even longer, depending on the variety, but within about a month as you know, to maintain that the best, you know, freshness, if you will. But again, you can keep it longer. One of the uh, quickest ways to prepare it would be to steam it. It takes much less time steaming than it would be in, say, you know, if you're roasting it or something like that. So you would have to peel it. You wouldn't want to remove the seeds, but you can save the seeds for roasting. Cut it into cubes, um, and it should take seven to ten minutes. Uh, this isn't usually how I do it, just because I prefer the taste of it roasted. But this is a really, you know, quick and easy way to to get it onto the table. Um, if you bake it, you don't have to peel it. You could, you know, just cut, sort of cut the ends, you know, poke, you know, poke it a little bit um, or cut it in half if you wanted to and roast it that way, oh, sort of open-faced. Um, if it's too difficult for you to cut, um, what you can do is, you know, pierce it a little bit and put it in the microwave for three to five minutes. That'll give you a head start. So it'll be softer to cut because if you do not have a sharp knife, if you don't have the strength, it can be, downright dangerous <laughs> to try and cut into that butternut squash. Um, but I, I like it the most in the oven. Um, and the way that I did the soup today, I did it right on the stove. So this is probably about the size of the butternut squash I use today. And the safest way that I found to cut and peel it, so I'll cut the top and bottom off so that it's, you know, has a flat surface. And then I take the peeler and I do one of these. I don't have the best peeler, I found that out today. Um, but you kind of like peel it this way, and every, whatever little bits are left over I use with my knife. But it still can be tough, you know, tough to cut. So keep that in mind. Keep your knives sharp. You know, dull knives are more dangerous than sharp knives. So keep that in mind. Um, also, remember that these things grow outside. And just because you're not eating the outside, same thing with something like a cantaloupe, a watermelon. You do want to give it a nice rinse and potentially a scrub, you know, depending on maybe like an acorn squash right it has all those um sort of ribs in it which i'm determined to get you to like i don't know why you don't like them we'll, I'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit um so just remember to give that a, a nice rinse with just cool running water all right so again depending on how you want it to taste um you have a lot of options with winter squash a lot of versatility with this you can you know sort of pull different flavors out it can lean sweet or savory, depending on what you're interested in. Dry heat, in particular with roasting, sort of helps to caramelize um, the natural sugars and bring out a little bit of nuttiness. Um, and also depends on the different spices that you like to use. Um, I, Like I said, I like roasting. I like roasting almost everything, Brussels sprouts. Oh, I could eat that all day, every day. Um, and you can also take advantage of that sweetness and put it in a pie instead of, say, a sweet potato or um, a yam or something like that. And certain varieties lean itself toward a creamy, you know, sorry, I have my dogs, <laughs> sort of a creamy preparation without needing, you know, any sort of like dairy or anything like that. Butternut, you know, in particular, you always hear about butternut squash soup. I also do like to include, you know, acorn um, in my soup and they're less stringy. So when they're less stringy, you sort of get that smooth, creamy um, texture you're looking for. So again, it freezes well, so if you can make you know a bigger batch when you have time over the weekend, then you'll have it you know for soups or for you know some sort of like one pan roasted meal to use later in the week or later in that month. 
Beth also sort of touched on the skins. So again, most of the time, you're not really gonna wanna eat the skins. Um, it's technically edible, but he wouldn't really you know, enjoy it. Uh, maybe not, Beth is saying no. Um, but the, like something like a delicata, you know, you certainly could. Um, thicker skins, not so much. You can save them and in, including your vegetable stock if you're looking to, you know, reduce your waste or use every part of that vegetable. Um, and again, use the seeds. Instead of tossing those seeds, you can sort of remove all that stringy stuff out and roast them. So you can put them in, a, you know, at a lower heat, I would say, so 275, 300, um, until they start to brown. So that I like to wrestle as soon as I have something to say. Um, but you want it to be at a lower heat because they can't, you know, they can, you know, brown or burn more easily. For a little olive oil, you, again, you can lean it either sweet or savory, do say nutmeg and cinnamon, or you could do chili powder and cumin. So here's just a handful of ideas. Um, so you can either puree in a food processor or treat like I am today with an immersion blender with coconut milk, curry powder, ginger, and garlic. That is very close to what I made today. Um, you can roast and puree it and use it as a creamy pasta dish. So you see a lot of like mac and cheese alternatives with a, squ you know, a squash sauce. Uh, you can almost treat it like a mashed potato. Um, so adding brown sugar, vanilla, toasted walnuts, maple syrup, you know, you can sort of um, go that way, or just stick with salt, pepper, and butter. Um, you could also mix it with pesto and Parmesan cheese. So again, you can do a lot with it. One of my favorite ways to prepare acorn squash, Beth. <laughs> so I cut it in half, and I um, so I roast it. So when you cut it in half and you scoop it out, it almost is like a little cup, right? And so I pierce it with my fork, put a little either butter or oil, maple syrup, some salt and pepper. And once it is roasted and soft, I wind up filling it. So I'll fill it with, I'm a vegetarian, so I'll do um, cannellini beans, maybe some spinach, maybe some cheese or something like that and put it back in the oven real quick. Herbs as well. And then you sort of, you know, you're eating it right out of its little bowl, which is really nice. Um, and you can sort of fit all those fall flavors in, which is nice. And again, get sort of a, a balanced meal, but. That sounds amazing. It's good. I'm. I just, I, I didn't make it today because it's not really a recipe. I just sort of, just kind of wing it. What a great idea. It's like the bread bowl just reinvented into a vegetable. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. I promise you it's very good. <laughs> um, so what I made today, it was, is, was, because it's sort of, you know, in, in, in the middle of being made. So it's a very simple squash soup and it is vegan. For anybody who's interested in it being vegan, you don't have to keep it vegan. Um, so I'm using, I started what I already did. Um, so I sauteed my onions, ginger and garlic with the avocado oil. This size squash was about what I used and it yielded somewhere between four and five cups of cubed squash. If you have a few acorn squash, if you have a smaller or bigger squash, you can really just adjust the liquid or the spices. And again, the liquid might depend on your preference, if you like a thicker soup or a thinner soup. Um, salt and pepper to taste. I really enjoy the taste of curry powder and something like this, but if you're absolutely against, you know, you don't like that flavor, you can stick with, say, cinnamon and nutmeg. You can go the chili powder and red pepper flake route. Um, but remember, we're including, you know, these aromatics, these um, compound, the compounds that are in things like turmeric and ginger and garlic and onion are all super beneficial. A little bit of maple syrup, again, just to bring out that sweetness, some coconut milk. So again, it's vegan, but the coconut milk sort of helps to smooth out um, the texture of the soup and vegetable broth. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll explain to you sorry, very specifically, you know, what I have already done and what I still have left to do. So again, I wish my kitchen was big enough to bring you with me. I will be redoing my kitchen. So one day I'll have a better kitchen. So again, and I'm also doing a little bit backwards. What I would usually do is add the liquid and let it sort of sit for a little bit and have the squash cook in that. But because I wanted to show you a little bit, I have already pretty much steamed the squash 
in a little bit of broth and the rest of the aromatics till it's fork tender, just for the purposes of this demonstration. So it's fork tender. And then I'm gonna add the, those liquids I was talking about and the maple syrup. So it's about a tablespoon of maple syrup. You can also leave this out completely. I got my like New York, you know, maple syrup. I have some light coconut milk because I still find it to be just as creamy without necessarily uh, needing the full fat coconut milk. And anybody who's used oh. coconut milk in savory cooking, it's not super coconutty. Like it's not super sweet. It really just gives it an interesting, <laughs> can you guys stop? <laughs> um, an interesting flavor. And again, sort of rounds out the texture of that soup. I have two cups of broth here. You, I'm gonna, I might start with a little bit, you know, maybe half and then add it as I need to. Um, but I'm gonna do half. And then I'll probably add a little bit more. Again, as it cooks, you know, it'll thicken and then maybe you'll um, uh, need to add a little bit more. But it only took me about 15 minutes to sort of cook that squash till fork tender. Um, so it really, this soup could be done in 30 minutes. It's really um, something, it comes together pretty quickly. I'm gonna mute myself because I'm gonna use my immersion blender, which is a relatively new gadget in my house, considering, you know, I'm in my 30s now and I just sort of realized that you don't have to, you know, ladle soup into a blender, little by little. So this is a really great tool, but I'm gonna mute myself. My husband just got one of those and he's been using it for various things. He's the kitchen fellow. I'm just the garden person. I was just going to say, I recently got one myself and I, I use it often. I used it the other day to make whipped cream because we usually use like the blender, the hand blender, right? But it was just, it was so much easier just with the one. Um, and yeah, and you can use it in like a stainless steel pot, which is cool. And it's, it's, longer so it fits into those deep pots that Nicole is using you know we're usually the hand blender you have to put it like all the way in there and maybe you don't get like a perfect blend so it's got a lot of benefits lovely oh, that looks so So you can tell how creamy it looks already. Again, there's no dairy in here. You could also get a similar consistency and texture without using the coconut milk if you wanted to just stick with the broth. It might not be as thick, but you'll still get you know, a pretty velvety soup. So this is something, again, I sort of did the recipe a little bit backwards just so I could show everything, but I would cook this maybe a little bit longer um, I would usually let the squash sit in the liquid for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then blend, but I might let it sit on the stove again to let all the flavors meld. It'll thicken up. Maybe I'll add some more broth, but again, it sort of depends on your preference. Same thing with all of those aromatics. If you don't like ginger, if you don't like garlic, if you're not a huge, you know, not a huge fan, you can also get turmeric root. And when you cook like fresh turmeric root, you really you don't taste it, it's not as potent as so you know the powdered, um, but you still get that beautiful color. Um, it's a deeper, it's in the same family as ginger, but it's a deeper orange if you've never seen the actual root. And same thing with the curry powder. So you would taste and adjust the seasonings as you would like. So I typically use low sodium um, broth uh, and I don't cook with a lot of salt, but again, that's a sort of a personal preference. But because we have all those other flavors, you might not, you know, miss the salt or need the salt that you would typically get from um, sort of a packaged soup or something like that. So I really wish I could share this with you. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, but this would be really nice with, you know, a grilled cheese, with uh, a salad if you wanted to stick with like, you know, if, you, if you're not a vegetarian and you want to do a salad with some maybe grilled chicken um, or something like that. And I also like the idea of using, so say you roasted a batch, like a huge pan of squash last week, and you're sort of midweek, and you're like, what am I gonna do with this? It's pretty much done for you. You know, the biggest part of it is, is really just waiting for the squash to get soft enough to puree. And of course, getting the flavor out of some of those, um, some of those aromatics. But, you, you know, you could sort of give yourself a head start. And it's 
could come together in 30 minutes. So it's not as labor intensive as you think. Squash can be a little intimidating to handle, um, but I definitely think it's worth it. So it's so tasty, it's so versatile, you can do a lot with it and it's so good for you. So it's one of my favorite things to cook with in the kitchen. Well, I'm delighted to hear that it freezes well. So the soup as well, you could also- you could freeze the soup too. Mm -hmm. I make a butternut squash soup. My kids won't eat it just because it's soup. They don't eat soup. Oh. Um, so there's always extra. But you a know? cream you soup. You can't make just a few cups of butternut squash soup. So I'm not a soup person, to be completely honest. I'm not a brothy soup person. I like a creamy soup that I can make it like dip a sandwich in or something. And so that's why this is right up my alley. I'm not a, you know, not that I have meat, but I'm not a chicken noodle soup person. I'm sort of even a minestrone, I would go for like a pasta fajoule that has like beans because the beans that are in it usually sort of make it a little starkier. Right, so it's not as thin and brothy. This is, I, grilled cheese, grilled cheese dipped in this or dipped in tomato soup, like I'm good. I'm good with a creamy soup. Oh, that's good. I'm very hungry. I know, it smells good. I promise. <laughs> but any questions, any questions? No, thank you guys. I mean, you you pretty much, you hit, you know, you hit the nail on the head with everything. And really, you asked some good questions after Beth's uh, presentation mm -hmm. about the pests. Like I said, this was really the first vegetable that we really uh, got into that. And that was really interesting. But that soup looked so delicious, Nicole. It made me so hungry. I wish I want to make it when I get home. I'm yeah. definitely going to make it this weekend. Definitely. Again, super simple. I, I'll send you the recipe card tomorrow. And you can finish Great. it off with again those toasted seeds that you made you sort of make it an all-in-one you know an all-in-one um soup to nuts dare i say <laughs> oh, i'm sorry soup to seeds. No, that was great it's super cool oh thank you so much let me end the recording here if we don't have anything else to add right we're good great thank you so much thank you very much